What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Saturdays in the SEC, episode 139. Uh, back to recap a wild week 13. I feel like we say that every week we get on this podcast. Um, man, it, it really was a volcanic Saturday in the SEC. Um, playoff contenders going down left and right. Um, just one thing we've learned about this season is just expect the unexpected because that's exactly what we've got. This is 2007 2.0. I mean, we're witnessing yeah. it right before our eyes. Um, Alabama goes to Norman, gets absolutely obliterated, and got to be one of the shocking games of the year. I mean, I don't think anybody had that on their bingo card as crazy as this year has been. Um, I think this is a more shocking loss than Vanderbilt, for real. Yeah, I, I think especially in the manner in, in which it happened was certainly uh, a huge surprise. Uh, Florida takes down Ole Miss in the swamp. Um, not really a surprise in that one, but I think you would have expected a much better performance, especially in the second half from Ole Miss with season on the line. Uh, Texas A&M loses in Jordan Hare in a, in a four-overtime classic. About time. Uh, so just upsets all over the place, top 15 teams. Uh, SEC championship hopes dash, playoff hopes dash. It was that kind of weekend. We said it last weekend there was upset potential all over the SEC, all over the country, and, and that's really what happened around college football. So we're going to dive straight into this Alabama-Oklahoma game. And uh, I've been dreading about talking about this since uh, – the end of the game Saturday night, um, man, I I mean, honestly, not much else to say. It was just a disgraceful, just pathetic performance from Alabama's offense. Um, you know, we looked at the stat line for the game or before we started recording. Oklahoma outrushed Alabama's total yardage uh, in this game. They really did a great job of controlling the clock. It really felt like Vandy 2.0 in in a sense. The Oklahoma came off a bye week. You saw some little Vanderbilt kind of nuances to their offense. They had that shovel pass a couple times. Did a great job of getting to the perimeter. You know, Alabama didn't do a good job of setting the edge and keeping Jackson Arnold, the running backs for Oklahoma, you know, inside the tackles. They consistently got to the perimeter was able to get some explosive runs. I thought Jackson Arnold did a great job of, you know, stepping up when Alabama didn't have, you know, good brush lane integrity, kind of being able to step through, uh, make some big scrambles with his legs. And I thought they did a good job of establishing that from the first drive of the game. Um, so um, didn't really do anything fancy, but was able to sustain drives, Um kind of dominate time of possession for a lot of the night, um, was able to to strike early. Um, and, the, and the crushing thing for Alabama was just the turnovers early in the second half. You throw back-to-back interceptions. One that Oklahoma ran to the 14-yard line, they ended up scoring off that. The very next drive, you throw a pick six, and it, it goes from a 10-3 to game early in the third quarter to 24-3 within – a matter of four or five minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, at that point, it was desperation time and uh, just an all-around terrible performance from Alabama's offense. Obviously, Jalen Milrose, you know, the the punching bag from this game. Uh, I thought the tackles were extremely disappointing. You know, Elijah Pritchett struggled for a while now. Um, Caden Proctor's been, been solid this year, but had some struggles here and there. The tackles from Alabama really struggled with the speed of Oklahoma from the edge. They were able to get some pressure. Um, you know, we were discussing before before we started recording. Thought Jalen Milro not only made some bad decisions in the passing game with a couple of the interceptions they threw, but I thought in the in the option game there was a couple times or quite a few times that he kept it, lost yardage, was trying to bounce it outside too much instead of getting north-south, taking what the defense was given. thought Brent Venables had an excellent game plan. They completely sealed the edges off, and they basically said, Jalen Milro, you are not getting to the perimeter. Because if you get to the perimeter, it's going to be a tough night for us. And then that's the way it's been for a lot of this year. Just ask LSU. When Jalen Milro was able to get to the perimeter 
get some explosive runs. That kind of opened up the entire offense. Um, Oklahoma completely shut that down from snap one to the end of the game. Um, was able to create some some tackles for losses. Um, got Alabama in some long third downs, and and you're not going to be a successful offense. Jalen Murrow is not going to thrive when it's third and long constantly. Um, just don't think he's able to consistently operate the offense, in, especially in the in the intermediate type of passing game that they need him to. I just think the offensive play calls are a little hamstrung with him back there, uh, especially when he's having an off night. Um, and I just think the the books out on Alabama when when the quarterback runs not going, this offense really really struggles. Um, when the quarterback runs able to get established, the running backs are able to get going a little bit. This offense can be really really good. And then you've seen in multiple losses this year, and and even a couple of the wins that the quarterback run game was really limited, and it pretty much shut Alabama's offense down completely. Uh, to a certain degree. So just a really disappointing performance. And I think what stings the most about it is, is it was another game you came out and just didn't look prepared. You just, with with everything on the line, everything's in front of you, SEC championship game, playoffs, and it's like you lay that kind of egg to that degree against a being kind of mediocre Oklahoma team. An Oklahoma team, as you highlighted earlier, only conference win was at Auburn, who gift wrapped it to them. I mean, they've gotten blown out. They were, they were without four of their starting five wide receivers. Still, and what, we're, what we're down, we're down a tackle, I believe, and we're on their second string center. What bothered me too is like some of the formations Alabama was running on defense. It was a numbers game most of the time. I'm like. Everybody's like, we can't stop them running. I'm like, we don't have enough guys in the box. I mean, it's six blocking five. Like, we're <laughs> not going to stop the run. Like, what? I would have manned these guys up and made Jackson Arnold and these receivers make a play on me down the field. How in the world they let them run down their throat makes no sense to me. I would have put damn all 11 guys in the box. You are <laughs> not running the ball on me. If you beat me down the field, and you beat us man to man, then you just beat us man to man. We'll have to live with it. But I'm not going to lose because you ran the ball down my throat and made me like it. I mean, that to me, I just did not understand why there was not more guys in the box, why there seemed to be no adjustments hardly during the game, which they limited things in the second half, but the offense gift wrapped them 14 points. So it's like your defense wasn't even out there that much in the second half. So – it was just – it was very frustrating with, with everything on the line to have this kind of performance. Um, but at the same credit, I want to give Oklahoma all the credit in the world. They had a fantastic game plan. They out-coached Alabama. They out physical Alabama. They out-executed Alabama. It was a complete obliteration uh, from them and a big win for Brent Venables. He, he said in the postgame perfectly, he's like, we wanted to come out, have a statement performance, have something to hang our hat on, and when we cut the film on, what does the evidence say? He was like, he's like, I got to give – he said, we're not beating our chest, but I got to give our guys credit for a physically dominating performance, and that's exactly what they had. My my hat, my hat's off to you, Brent Venables. Um, you use the bye week extremely well with a great game plan defensively. We know how good of a defensive mind he is. And I thought offensively had some good wrinkles that maybe Alabama wasn't expecting and and really took advantage of their weaknesses that some other teams have exposed throughout the year. So my hat's off to, to Oklahoma. They're going bowling. It's been a tough year, a first year in the SEC for them. Um, but they got a, a big-time signature win on the season and for Brent Venables and, and their program. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, no one would have expected this outcome it being a win period, but with the, the with the dominance that it came from uh, or, or came with. Uh, you look at their their stat sheet; they ran sixty one plays. Let me four down. Yeah, sixty one plays, and they ran it forty nine times. 
that tells you all you need to know. I mean, that just tells you dominated the line of scrimmage. We're able to dominate the, the time of possession, and they got points when they had the opportunity to score points. I mean, early in the game, it really I – I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to say sloppy or ugly, but it was just a, you know, a, a hard-nosed SEC-type game, low scoring, you know, a missed still go here. Nobody can really get it across the end zone. Nobody can really dominate when they're in the red zone or really get to the red zone. Um, they trade field goals, you know, goes into halftime. What was it, 6-3 to three or 3-3 three to three at halftime, I believe? Uh, yeah, it was, t I believe, 10 to 3. I think they, oh, that's right. they had a late touchdown right before, yeah. into the corner of the end zone right before the halftime. So, yep, so that's right. 10 to 3. And you're like, okay, you've seen this from Alabama plenty of times. They're, they're down a touchdown or they're down a possession. Going into halftime, they come out and they really just dominate. But like you said, hats off to Oklahoma's defense for coming out in the second half and they really made things happen. Stutzman, uh, another 100 or 100 tackles in a season that's the third I think it's the third time in his career that he's done that so you know absolutely he's a dog on the field the the pick on the the screen the first pick that they returned down to the 10 yard line that set up the their first touchdown at a halftime um I, you can't really blame that on Milrow you, your receivers got to pick up that block it's three on two you're going to throw that every single time I mean they said on the broadcast but Three on two, you're going to throw that every single time. You have got to trust that your receivers are going to pick up the block. Yeah, I know the DB jumped the route. Great play by the DB, but your receivers have got to pick up a block there. I mean, that cost you big time, clearly. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you you put your defense at a – they got 12 yards to score. I mean, not many people – you're going to at least get a field goal out of that 99% of the time. So, I mean, I just – in the second half, I just thought, especially after the, se the second pick, so, they, you know – they throw that, the interception, it goes down, and then they score. Jackson Hunter runs in, they score, whatever happens. Then they get the ball back, and they're actually putting a nice drive together. And you're like, okay, now Alabama's going to fight back. They're going to find it. And then they throw a pick six. I just don't think he saw the guy. I just think it was a bad read. But they throw, they throw a pick six there after they had, you know, started piecing the drive together. And that really, I felt like, deflated them. You could just tell it took the air out of the team, uh, especially with the attempted tackle that Milrow had. I'm not trying to be a dead horse while they're down, but what was that, man? Like, you – Give me a little better effort. Like that's on you. You just do that pick, and now you're. Just, I know you're. You, you know you want to protect yourself. You, obviously, all that, but that was that was bush league, in my opinion. I'd have been upset if I was a teammate of his. Like what you know, what is that, dude? And after that play, I mean, it the stadium was rocking, obviously, and <clears throat> what Alabama was doing well was running it with the running backs. They weren't able to go on that because the dic the the game was dictating the, their play calls. I mean, they were down three three possessions. You know, it's in the second half. You got. You've got to be able to put points up because the other team is consistently getting first downs or draining the clock, so you got to go through the air. It changes your whole entire game plan. Yeah. People were upset that they weren't running it in the second half. But they, you really couldn't run it in the second half because it, the game dictated that. So I'm excited for this weekend. Um, I don't think Alabama – I don't think their team is full of a bunch of quitters. I know that their season is pretty much over of what Alabama expectations are, but they're not full of quitters. they got some dogs on that team. I expect this Iron Bowl to be – absolutely electric like it is every single year. Um, both teams could be 0 and, 0 and 10 going in this game or 0 and 11 going in this game, and it's going to be a dogfight every time. This this game matters. Um, it still matters. And so I, I'm, I'm excited for this weekend. Um, I do think that Alabama has the upper hand. We'll get into this later, but I, I do think that Alabama's probably going to win. I think the line is a bit, a bit big, um, especially after this past weekend. I know that doesn't play too much of an effect into it. Um, but it opened up at 15 and a half, Alabama 15 and a half point favorite. I, last I checked, it's down to 12 and a half, 11 and a half around that area. I thought it would be closer to probably like seven and a half, eight and a half around there. But, you know, I, I would say take the Auburn spread if it's around the double digits. But I do think that Alabama is going to win. Um, I just, it's the Iron Bowl that you really can never tell what to expect. Auburn's kind of, they're, they're getting better and better and gaining more confidence. And Alabama's still a really good football team. So I think that it's going to be, not quite a shootout, but I don't. I don't think that it's just going to be a, a, a skull dragging one way or the other. Um, but I, I do want. To, speaking of Auburn, I would like to move into that game. I mean, Lord have mercy, I finally get to call a real good conference win. I mean, to finally talk about one against Kentucky. This is a real ranked conference win. First one under Hugh Freeze. Now one in seven. Woof. But <clears throat> getting better. You can see it. You can see the vision is there. They finally were able to close out the game. Obviously, starting out, we're taking some shots. I thought, man, when when you get A&M to jump off sides and you take the free pass deep ball and 
put it perfectly back shoulder ball right on Cam Coleman and right at the one yard line. I mean, it's just it was really, really beautifully done. Um, all game. Cam Coleman had another fantastic day. Uh, Keandre Lambert Smith had another really, really, really good day. I mean, made two of the greatest catches of the season in the same game. Um, I thought Peyton Thorne played extremely well, minus one play. Uh, for, start of the fourth quarter, you know, turns it over, throws an interception. Other than that, he he played really, really well. Without without him, Auburn doesn't get in field goal range at the end to tie it and send it to overtime. He had a long 20-something yard run on fourth and two. I mean, absolutely amazing. He put the team on his back at times. Jarquez Hunter, dominant again. Uh, finally, finally fed him like we were asking him to again. He got 28 carries, career high. Uh, so, I mean – it was it was fantastic, but I do Auburn's defense absolutely deserves all the credit for this win. One million percent, ten times over. I, everybody's talking about uh, Keandre Lambert Smith and Cam Coleman and Jarquez Hunter, and rightfully so. By God, they they put on a show. But Auburn's defense is the hundred percent the reason that Auburn won this game because Auburn had bat two. Bad, bad punts. I don't bad's not even the word to describe it. Given AM short, short field. Auburn forces Auburn has two sacks on one of them at the 50 yard line and, and gets them out of field goal range. And then another one they end up going for it on fourth down and Auburn stops them, turns the ball over. Uh so when Auburn's offense put Auburn's defense back against the wall, their defense answered every single time. It was it was one of the best showings from our defense that I've seen all year. They were actually able to finish. Um, getting to the quarterback wasn't an issue. I felt like there was pressure really heavy all night. Um, it was the getting the quarterback down. Uh, that was that was the tough part. We 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 would get there. I, I'd say we probably forty sixty when we would get there to not getting there. But Auburn was able to disrupt the pocket a little bit all night. And man, this Marcel Reed, he is. I now know what opposing teams felt when Auburn had Nick Marshall in the backfield because that's exactly what he reminded me of, man. You'd have him bottled up. He was just so slippery. He'd break out and get a couple-yard gain or get a big gain and complete the pass down the field. Um, so I thought, you know, that was that was fantastic by the defense to be able to, to bottle him up as best they could uh, and, and to, you know, silence him as best they could. I do want to – Focus on Texas A&M for a second. Great job of them coming back. Down 21 nothing on the road. You, you you pretty much – Auburn scores one more, you're out of it. They had a chance to and didn't didn't pull through. And then they, they punch back and then they fight back again. But Mike Elko's clock management on Saturday was one of the worst I've seen in, in quite some time. There was, there was one play or one time in the first half – where the play clock was down to like 18 or something, and he had a late substitution on offense. So obviously, you have substitute on offense, defense gets a chance to substitute. So the ref comes in and holds the ball, holds the play, and then Auburn sends in a late substitution. Guy comes off, runs down the play clock, he's got to waste a timeout, got to burn a timeout there. That's just why even why even uh put a guy in there? Like you you gotta be better than that clock management wise. That was that was bad. And then the very end of regulation time. It's 31-28. Texas A&M has the lead. Auburn has – there's 20-something, 20 23 seconds left on the clock, 26 seconds, something like that. They complete a pass or run run a play – have a run play down to the, I don't know, seven, eight-yard line. And Auburn has no more timeouts. They're getting up to the to the line of scrimmage to – it's third, third and goal. Getting up to the line of scrimmage to spike the ball. You're going to have – you're going to spike the ball, then you're going to have to rush your field goal unit out there try to kick the extra point. And he called a timeout. I thought that was – I don't know why he called a timeout there. I thought that was a little strange. Uh, but I, I just thought his clock management wasn't great. It helped Auburn both times. Um, so, I, I mean, obviously Auburn didn't score a touchdown off of it, but he called that timeout and allowed Auburn to come over to the sidelines and have a third down play that they wanted to run. And then, obviously, had a penalties. There was – why I think Auburn's going to struggle in bryant Denny Stadium and why I'm not – Obviously, of how great the game was, we're going to get back into that. But why I don't think that I'm super high on Auburn this week is because Auburn was struggling with false starts this week inside their own stadium. And, and not just middle mop-up time in the middle of the game when we're up 21 nothing. When it's down there, the last drive of the game, Auburn's got no timeouts. There was two false starts in the same drive within five plays of each other. 
There was another one, the drive before that, that stalled him out. It had a third and five and brought him back to a third and ten. I mean, there was a bunch of times where Auburn shot themselves in the foot and tried to give it back to Texas A&M. But I just – that's why I'm not super, super high on on my my feelings of how the game's going to go in Bryant-Denny this week. But, I mean, you know, anything can happen. But back to Texas A&M and Auburn, I, I thought that, again, te- Auburn's defense played out of their minds. The young guys played extremely great. Caleb Harris, if he doesn't have a the – Auburn there's, is right before the two-minute warning – Texas A&M's up. They fumble the snap. Quick timeout. So a second and 12, second and 16, something like that. They run a play, tackling, quick timeout. It's third and 10. If they get a first down, it's ball game. They're, they're going to win. And Amari Daniels busted out to the left, and K- he's got nobody to beat but Caleb Harris. And freshman Caleb Harris makes a game-saving tackle to force them to punt the ball away. Um, and speaking of Amari Daniels, if you look at his stat line, he had – I don't remember how many carries, but he only ran for 90 yards. I'm going to, he, His average was 3.3 yards per carry. I'm going to be real with you. If you just watched this game and didn't look at that stat sheet, you would think that he ran for 120 yards and had 8 to 10 yards of carry. I mean, seriously, it's, it felt like every time he got the ball, he was getting a 6, 7-yard gain right up the middle. It was very frustrating. He had a couple of big gains that got called back from penalties. Um now, Texas A&M definitely helped Auburn at times. Auburn didn't just dominate completely at, uh, in the second half. Texas A&M gave them some things, had some had a penalty on fourth down that cost them. You know, that they would have had – it was would have been offensive pass interference, but it ended up being a legal man downfield. So that gave them one away. But I do want to touch on the absolutely atrocious officiating that's going on in the SEC. I know we've covered it a bunch. And now I can talk about it, and y'all know that I'm not just bitching because Auburn lost, because Auburn won this game, and I'm still going to talk about how atrocious this officiating has been all year, but especially in this game. Uh, I didn't get to watch the full length of the Alabama-Oklahoma game. I watched majority of it, but I didn't watch every single solitary play, but I did watch the bad egregious plays in that game too, so I know it was bad there. Yeah. But the Auburn game, there were some – blatant missed calls, like absolutely 100% should 1,000% be a penalty, and they weren't called. And then there were some plays that's like, ah, it's that, let the guys play, let the boys play, or there was no penalty at all, and they're tossing yellow ones. I'm like, what's going on? So earlier, and it was, I believe it was in the third quarter, might have been in the fourth quarter of the Auburn-Texas A&M game, Texas A&M, Auburn's on offense. Texas A&M is third and 13, by the way, I do believe, maybe second and 13. Texas A&M's running guys off the field, they got like 15 guys on the field, and Auburn tries to snap it. No flag. Whatever. That was it was second down, and Auburn ends up being third and 13 after that. No flag should have been a fresh set of downs. Then you go into overtime. And Keandre Lambert Smith has beat his DB. He is going to be wide open for a touchdown. His DB knows it. So he grabs the back of his shoulder pads, covering his nameplate. You can see his fingers are inside of his not his jersey, his shoulder pads. Clear, plain as day, offensive pass interference. No call. The very next play, Auburn, Keandre Lambert Smith's on the right side. He's running a up and out dig. Well, I don't know what the route was. He was running. He's running across the field, whatever, this way. Going towards one sideline. Um, Rivaldo Fairweather running like a crosser going the other way. They're, they're crossing each other. Well, the DB – and there's a DB and Rivaldo, they kind of get tangled up in the open field. There is, it was not intentional at all. You can tell that Rivaldo was just trying to run his route and the DB was just playing defense. They run into each other. Keandre's left wide ass open, catches the ball. This is in overtime now, second overtime, catches the ball, goes all the way down, or it might have been third overtime, goes all the way down to the two yard line. So first and goal from the two, all four scores a touchdown, they win. Second goal from the two. Or first and goal from the two, flag comes out, offensive pass interference on 13. Biggest BS call ever. Because if you go back and look at it, you pointed this out to me, and I went back and looked, and you are 100% correct. If you watch the DB and if you watch the guy that Rivaldo ran into, as soon as they hit each other, that DB flips his hips and starts running with Rivaldo to cover him. So it's yeah. not it was like it, he wasn't even trying to cover Keandre. So it was – it was egregious. There was, but there was multiple things throughout the game that I thought should have been called that weren't called and things that weren't called that should have been called or that were called that shouldn't have been called. Things, Whatever. You, you get what I'm saying. It's been egregious. I, 
to be as powerful and dominant as the SEC is, that they don't have full-time officials is beyond me. Um, these are part-time workers. I mean, I know that they're getting paid well and they do it all the time, but these are not full-time employees. They need to have this be full-time employees where these guys are watching film, where these guys got to answer to everybody. I just, it's too good of a product everywhere else to have the ones that, it, to have the ones that are governing the game to be so dog shit. It is, it is too, way too good of a product to be hindered by the referees or for games to be decided by the referees. It, it, it's ridiculous. I, I, I want to touch on one more thing before I'm done because I'm on my soapbox right now and I'll let you get on to yours. Um, <laughs> Ian Vashon, we all love you. It should have never gone to overtime, by the way, because in the third quarter, Ian Vashon misses a field goal that would have put Auburn up 31-21. to 21. Uh, and then they would have kicked the field goal at the end that would have tied it, would have actually been the walk it off and win 34 to 20, 34 to 31. But whatever, didn't happen. Auburn still got the win. Ian Vashon, after he missed that field goal, he sacked up and he made two more. And so we couldn't be prouder of you. Keandre Lambert Smith, the, the final play in the end zone, making that fantastic play. I mean, it, it can't be talked about enough. Cam Coleman, they disguised things so well early. And then Texas A&M started bringing the house on defense, and that's what really disrupted Auburn. They got them off their their role. They were bringing the house a lot. They were getting pressure on Peyton, and that we weren't able to to get open, and he was getting sacked or he was getting flustered. So that kind of stalled us out a little bit. But Jarquez Hunter ran the ball extremely well. Um, Peyton did exactly what he needed to do, minus one play. The receivers are finally coming into their own. They're playing extremely well. I'm glad KLS is is able to have this final season where he's probably going to be a thousand yard receiver. So I mean, it, it, it's shaping up where Auburn could potentially be bowl eligible if they win the Iron Bowl. Anything could happen in the Iron Bowl. But I I, I want to get your thoughts on the game and and especially, excuse me, the officiating because again, I, I know that we talk about it and. I know there's not just people lined up out the ass to go be an official. I know it's not an easy job to do. I know that you have a lot of hatred come towards you, whether whatever call you make. What, what, every game, a fan base is going to be pissed at you about something. So yeah. you can never win no matter what. I know that nobody – it's not a fun job to have when it comes to the criticism. But if you're going to have the best product in college football, it needs to be the best product in everything, not everything, and in the officials. The officials need to be the best of the best because you got to let the guys decide it. The zebras got to quit deciding these ball games, and they have played a major factor. Number one being right here, South Carolina not being in the playoff, especially in playoff contention right now because they get absolutely robbed in week three on some BS. You got to let the boys decide it. It's getting a little egregious, but I want to hear your thoughts on the Auburn AM game and the officiating. Well, I mean, I'll say this on the officiating this is a billion with a B, billion dollar enterprise. There is hundreds of millions. Like I said, if you total everything up, we're in the billions with damn nickel and dime officiating. Yep. That Honestly, it's what it Thumbs is. It this perfectly. is a billion dollar business with nickel and dime half-ass officiating. I mean, it's been that way for a while. Amen. And the thing is, it's we're, we're get, as we're getting more modern, it's getting worse. It should be yes. getting better. We have replay. We have things that we used to not have. And, I mean, honestly, we have replay and can't get the calls right half the time. So, um, yeah, I think, um, I think it, there needs to be a – I don't know, like a, a nationalized governing body over officiating work because you have each conference doing a different thing. You know, each crew calls it, you know, each conference has it a little bit different, you know. Um, you know, some so that some, screws it up in the playoffs a uh, big time. Yeah. I mean, that that's kind of a big deal more so than like college basketball, because you have certain officials that work for certain conferences and they you know, some crews will call or way more fouls and allow way less contact, and then you'll have other crews that allow a lot more physical game. Yeah. So it's just it's just all over the place, and I think you get a little bit of that too in college football, um, just based on the different conferences and things. And yeah, how these guys are not like full time employees. Like, it, I mean, you're talking about this big of an enterprise, and you don't even have full time officials. Like that, that are in a lot of cases determining outcomes of games, and they're not even 
they're not even full time. Like I, I just don't, it doesn't make any sense really. Um, I guess it's just something that's been so far on the back burner that they're just like, oh well, we just we won't really put as many resources into that, you know. But it's like until they really start caring about it, it's going to be the same that it always is. Um, so I think it's something that it's got to get to the point, and I hope it doesn't keep getting worse. But it, like it's going to have to keep getting to the point where it's so egregious that they're going to have to do something about it. It's really already at that point, but there's been no movement on it. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I think there should be like a national like guideline that like, I, I don't know. I, I just think the way they do officiating well, across agree. the country it, it is not be, very good. It shouldn't be conference by conference. The conferences are so screwed up now. It doesn't even matter when you're talking about travel wise. Well, these guys don't want to travel. Across. It doesn't matter. You got, you got USC in the Big Ten, like UCLA in the Big Ten. It, it doesn't matter. They're they're traveling cross country anyway. So they, you're right. It needs to be a national board of referees or whatever the hell they want to call it. And then you call it all the same. Everybody's got the same guidelines, and they're they're not no longer associated with a conference ever again. They are just college football officials. And you pick a crew and you say, you're going to this game, you're going to this game, you're going to this game. And they get switched up every week where you're not calling the same teams week after week after week or the same teams four times a year. You just – you have a group of however many thousands, hundreds of, of officials, and you say, you five are going here, you five are 12, however many. I know there's guys in the box and all that stuff. But that's what it needs to be, not by conference, by conference. It's College football is so big now. The conferences – it has nothing to do on the bearings of where schools are, so it shouldn't matter. It should all be under one bubble like everything else is in college football and just have the officials be the college football officials and get sent places every week. Yeah, well, I, I'll be honest. When I hate seeing Ken Williamson come on my TV screen calling an Alabama game because when I hear we've got Ken Williamson, I'm like, we got five damn holes before we even get off the bus, dude. Like, it, it, it's <laughs> – it's gonna be a night, that's for sure. But man, yeah, I I think or at least the Power Four conferences ought to have their own official or something like. Just however you want to do it, there's got to be more investment, more emphasis on getting the officiating right and improving the quality of it. Whether you got to make them employees or whatnot, but it's like I, I don't know. Like I'm. I mean, the best comparison is it's a billion dollar industry with nickel and dime officiating, but it's like, yeah. I mean, it's like having a McLaren with like ten dollar rims on it. I mean, it's yeah. just it makes no 100%. sense. I mean, it's like, oh, I mean, we've got the nicest sports car out there, and we got the cheapest tires we can put on it. It just it yeah. makes no sense um, the way they do it. So, but I think there, there's got to be more of an emphasis on it. It's a it's an epidemic for sure. For them to have such an impact on the game, it's crazy that they're not full-time officials. And Three Man Front brings us up a lot. Pat Smith, in particular, he says that he thinks they should be able. They have. They should have to face media after every game and answer to their. Sure. Why did you make this? Call? Why did you make? Or maybe not. Maybe not after the game, but on Sunday morning or on Monday morning, like the coaches address the pressers or the media on Monday morning. Um, make the referees do that, or make them do it right after the game. There's. They're, they have got to be held accountable to have as much of a of an impact on the game, the outcome that they do. They have they have got to be held more accountable than they are. That that is one hundred percent a fact. Anybody would agree with because For they're sure. not held accountable yeah. at all, at, at all. When they no, miss a I'm, call and it's blatant that they miss a call, oh well, whatever. I'm gonna call next week anyway. I'm gonna call for ten more years, even though I suck. This is my job. Yeah, Ridiculous. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean. Players get cut, coaches get fired all the time for doing their job poorly, but officiate officials just keep getting rewarded for doing. Yep, I mean, year after year, you know. So it, yeah, it's definitely. I mean, the epidemic. I mean, in the SEC specifically. I mean, I think around the country. I think a lot of other conferences could say the same thing too. But just kind of looking at from the SEC perspective, I I hope that's something that that gets improved. I mean. We have all the technology to assist. I mean, that's what I'm saying. And as we're getting more modern, we seem to be getting worse, you know, in, in a way. So the um, thing that bugs me the most is just the impact that they have on the game in the sense of sometimes they don't just let the guys 
don't let it play out through the guys. Like, like if you're running a stretch play to the right and the receiver on the left side gives a little slight tug to the DB's jersey, don't throw your flag. That play has got no bearing on the result of the play. Yeah. Now, if he's tackling him or slinging him to the ground, it's egregious, okay. But there's times where it'll be something light that has nothing to do anywhere in the vicinity of where the ball is on the field, and they throw the flag, and it just like that. Let the boys I, – I don't. that's the stuff that drives yeah, me the most for sure. crazy yeah. is that you're taking the the – you're taking the power to make the plays at, or to, to win the game out of the kids' hands and you're putting it all on you. I, I don't know. It, it, that Those type of things drive me nuts. Like, everybody misses a call. Everybody makes mistakes. It, nobody's perfect in their job. I get it. But the fact that they have that much of an impact is, is what it, why it needs to be – they need to be held accountable. For sure. Um, I, I think kind of with the Auburn game, uh, just kind of what I – what I saw from them and A and M this game, I did. Um, I thought I thought for the most part, I thought Peyton Thorne was extremely good. I thought he made really good decisions. Um, I thought it was big too being able to get some explosive plays down the field because you feel like that's what's been lacking a lot that's of the right. season. Um, you know, getting getting Cam Coleman, you know, down the field. Keandre Lambert Smith, man, he has been so solid for this team. I mean, just making. Play after play, contested catches. Um, I th- I feel like he's brought a lot of big leadership to that room. Like I, I think he's a guy that's gonna help. He's helped those young guys out a ton, and I think that's something that's gonna help them the rest of their careers. Having a guy who's been there, done that, played high level of football, um, has proved it this year. Um, I mean that that final catch in overtime was that was the. I don't know. You probably got flashbacks to the Kelvin Benjamin play. I mean, that was it. I mean, that catch looked almost identical. Exact same play. Yeah, exact same play. Um, you know, I Peyton was getting flashbacks the whole game. I was getting well, the second half. I was getting flashbacks to the 2021 Mississippi State game in Jordan Hare where we blew a 24 point lead. That's what I was getting flashbacks to the whole game. I was like, oh, "This is happening all over again." Luckily, we we saved it. But continue. Yeah. No. I I thought honestly, I thought when Auburn jumped up 21 nothing. I th- I thought it was probably going to be over. I, I thought A&M would fight back. I didn't think they'd get beat by 40 or anything, but I, I didn't think – I didn't know if they would come back and tie it up. And when it got to 21 all, um, but just just kept battling. Like you said, I thought Auburn's defense was, was really impressive. Got put in some tough positions a few times, as you mentioned, uh, from special teams. Um but yeah, just thought Jarquez, man, ran hard. I thought his blocking was really good. Um, so, seen some improvements from the offensive line as a whole, and like receivers on the perimeter. I think those are things that have been improved recently too. So, yeah, all in all, a big confidence game, a big a big win for the program, and you saw the excitement. Um, you know, a lot of recruits on hand. Like you, you, you've already seen that kind of payoff in recruiting, even just the last two days. Um, so just a big win, uh, especially going in the Iron Bowl, having the chance to be bowl eligible, um, and kind of, you know, get some because you work so hard and you're you've been so close in so many games. I feel like a similar situation to Florida. It's like they've. They've been in positions at times. They've kind of been grinding through it and had mm-hmm. struggles. And then when you finally see it pay off, it's just such a relief to an excitement to see like your hard work and you're grinding through those tough times and it finally pay off with a big win. Uh, you can tell the the joy and what it means to the, the players there and for for the program as a whole. So, um, yeah, Something- just re- really big win for, for Auburn. Something else that I was super proud of Auburn for that we haven't seen all year, really, is they did jump out to a huge lead. But when A&M tied it up and had all of the momentum, they were able to punch back and, and put another one in the end zone. It wasn't the very next drive. It was two drives later. They they got they got stopped, and then they created a stop on, de- on defense. But being able to answer that bell at that time, we have not seen that this year. And then when they go and they tie it up, and then they take the lead to be able to drive down 87 yards or 84 yards in 
two minutes, two, two, two minutes, 20 seconds with no timeouts to be able to answer that bell really should have scored a touchdown, but had some penalties that hurt us. But to be able to answer that and, and go into overtime, that that's something that we haven't seen from Auburn in probably since 2019, 2018. So seeing that, it, it was very motivating because you can see the 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 it's coming together. Like you can see the vision is finally coming together. I know there's still a long way to go, but you it finally happened. They were able to finish out a game. But being able to answer the bell not once but twice, especially late in the game, after all the momentum has been sucked right back out of your sideline, I thought that was fantastic, and, and hats off to them for that. Uh, definitely no, no quit in those guys. Yeah, for sure. And another team that hasn't quit at all either, and that is running seasons left and right, is the Florida Gators. I Absolutely. Mean, for Billy Napier to get this group after the struggles they've had to six and five now, great chance to go seven and five uh, after beating, uh, assuming they beat Florida State, which I believe they will this Saturday. Um, just really impressive the way he's kept that team together. I mean, a lot of people early, uh, pretty much everyone figured he would be ran out by midseason and that that team would just completely fall apart. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, I was right there with you. I think – I mean, I would say 99% of anybody that follows college football is like, yeah, that's a a dead man walking. Um, That team's probably going to fall apart at the seams and uh, they're going to, you know – flounder around to a three-win season or something like that. Man, he just kept them together. I mean, this this defense especially has improved so much from early in the season to now. Like, I would love to see them play A&M again. Yeah. Like, I would love to see them play Miami again. Like, With I mean, I, I think, I think these are teams that they would love a second opportunity at the way they're playing right now. They've – kind of figured themselves out, their identity. Like I said, defensively, start with their defensive front, generate pressure the way they have the last few weeks. Um, I thought Jackson Dart, too, I thought he was fantastic in the first half. He's like 12 to 16 at halftime, making some big-time throws, like with pressure in the pocket, um, kind of buying some times with his legs and, and finding guys down three. I thought he was excellent in the first half. And Florida was really able to turn the pressure up in the second half. And um, at, at the at the end of that game, the last few possessions, that's as bad as we've seen Jackson Dart play. Yeah, I mean, lo- he, losing losing Trey Harris in the what second quarter that hurt him too, or third yeah, quarter, whatever sure. they lost him, that hurt him big time because he's your he's your main threat that you got, and that he's the main guy that Dart looks to in situations like that and must have situations, and not having him on the field hurt. Yeah, definitely. Um, I just thought Florida was able to generate a lot more pressure in the in the second oh, yeah. half and, and make him uncomfortable, uh, confused him. I mean, you, you could tell he was definitely rattled there at the end of the game, I think, through basically three straight picks. One got called back. But, um, yeah, just definitely some confu- – and it wasn't all his fault. There was some miscommunication with his receivers as well. Well, so. a lot of blame can go on Lane Kiffin too because he made some – Dumb calls on third and fourth downs. I mean, yes. dumb. So a lot, a, most of the blame, in my opinion, goes on Lane Kiffin, one thousand percent. And I think too, uh, kind of going on that, um, you know, they ran JJ Pegues a few times off tackle on fourth and one, and made no sense to me. That's too big of a guy. He's too slow to get off tackle. And I heard made- today that he had more carries than any other running back on the roster. Yeah, that that's crazy. But that should why, like what that that is dumb. But yeah, running run him up the middle. Don't run him in the perimeter. What are we no. doing? Uh, yeah, it made. I mean, really, the difference in this game. Honestly, you look at the red zone stats. They had three trips into the red zone, turnover on downs twice, and a missed field goal. So they got zero points on three red zone drives. That was really the game. Honestly, like if they if they're able to convert. In the red zone, they win this game. Uh, they didn't, like you said, it got stopped on fourth down twice. Um, missed the field goal that Caden Davis has been really reliable all year. So, um, yeah, really just missed opportunities. And Florida turned it up in the second half. And um, man, they're they're playing as hard as any team in the country. And um, you know, kind of going back and watching the the film and the game earlier. 
man, like DJ Lagway, his stat line, you look at most of his stat lines this year, it's not going to wow you, but, like, you actually watch him play and you're like, man, like, this guy is – he's got it. Like, he's got that it factor. Um, You know, not perfect by any means. I mean, there's some decisions that he would like to have back and some, some times where he could have got rid of the ball quicker and took a sack and things like that. But his movement in the pocket, just his presence, the way he can buy time a little bit. We were talking about earlier how he can change his arm angle a few times and get throws off, you know. Um, he reminds me a lot of, like, Baker, and it's like if you made Baker and Johnny Manziel into one quarterback. It's what he reminds me of. The change in the arm angle is like, um, like Johnny Manziel being able to be elusive in the pocket like Johnny Manziel, but being a dog and being able to pick apart defenses if necessary like Baker, but also yeah. not scared to tuck it and run and putting your shoulder down like Baker. Like, that's what he reminds me of. I see Baker and Johnny Manziel when I watch him play. Yeah, I think too. With he's been a little limited with the hamstring since he's came back off of that, and I just think it's really re impressive with him. Like you see, a lot of guys are moving in the pocket to run. Like he, the way he can still keep his eyes downfield, like he's moving in the pocket to make a play through the air. Like right. he's not really looking to tuck it and run. Like right. you can see young quarterbacks, especially that got that kind of athleticism. You know, a lot of times they'll be quick to bail out of the pocket. Yeah. And with him, like, I just really like his patience, um, his presence back there, his movement, the way he can kind of be able to sidestep, be able to step up in the pocket to buy himself an extra second or two. Just really impressed watching. Like, watching him play is a lot more than just – what. like, if you just looked at the box score, you'd be like, you know, eh, you know, pretty good, but not it's not gonna blow you away. But you actually watch him play and you're like, man, like you just you see the the potential, you see the I mean, he's already good, but you just see like, man, what's he gonna be in a year or two? I mean, he Florida's got him one, man. They got they got a really <laughs> a really good quarterback. We've talked a lot about him. Um, but man, some of these other young guys too, man, really impressive. Jaden Ball, I mean, kind of Probably one of my favorite running backs to watch in the SEC. He's got a really bright future. Um, this defensive line, though, has really impressed me a lot. That That's what's helped turn their defense around. Their secondary, man, they were just physical. They were hitting. They jarred the ball, uh, jarred the ball loose several times from Ole Miss receivers. So, yeah, just a really impressive win to, to knock LSU out of SEC championship contention, playoff contention, same thing with Ole Miss. Them doing that back-to-back -back weeks is really impressive. So, hats off to Billy Napier. And, uh, yeah, this this team's definitely on the up and up. And it just – it's a lesson to – you got to judge coaches at the end of the season. Because, man, stuff varies week by week so much in the SEC, especially this year. Man, your opinion's just like this. All, I mean, that's how <laughs> – that's just how it is. And – I think you got to, you know, judge the full body of work at the end of the year because now, like, man, everybody's like, man, Napier, what a great job he was. Man, five weeks ago he was out on his ass, and now he looks like a coach of the year candidate. Now, yeah. like, he very he very well could win SEC coach of the year. If they finish seven and five with that schedule, like, he's going to be in the running with Shane Beamer and Clark Lee. Like, it's, it's them three in my opinion. So, um you can I, don't make think Clark, I don't think Clark Lee's in there anymore. I don't think they. Yeah, that, that's that's that. probably a good point. I think I think, they, think I think he will be a finalist. Like, yeah. and and I just don't think. I think you're right. It's going to be down to Napier and Beamer. I think Beamer's going to win it, but I, I I think that Napier has overtaken Clark Lee's spot in the Coach of the Year uh, rankings. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that for sure. Um, but I, but I you, think when you look at where they were early to get to seven and five would be. It would be monumental, honestly. And it's already paying off for them with recruiting after they announce he's coming back. It's it's been yeah. a huge momentum swing. And you know, you said you you know, our opinions were like this, you know, on him. Well, you know what opinion of mine has been like this for forever, just stayed flat on plane, is that Eli Drinkwitz is the biggest joke in all of college football. Dude, I, I get that tempers are flaring. I get it's a it's a very uh, emotional game. Uh, I understand that. It's it's football, you know. It's not a nice game. You know, and they're not out there telling each other great job after every play, every play. I get that. 
But when the head man is hollering at the other team, and I know it got snippy. I know there were some, you know, it, it got heated. But when the head coach is hollering at the other team, shut the F up, shut the F up, or I'm going to score. Like, dude, you are a leader of men on a national level in front of multi-millions every week. And you're going to act like a little jerk off like that. I just, that is, he's the biggest joke in college football. I, I don't I, I don't know how anybody could realistically see that happening after we saw him hollering F you, F you to Alabama down 56 or whatever he was down at the time. I just I, – I, he is an absolute joke to me when it comes to representing Missouri and being an outstanding leader of young men. It Joke, complete joke. Yeah, and, uh, and two, I mean – Obviously, Missouri folks probably don't care that much. I mean, when it's your own guy, you know, you kind of kind of overlook things. And I think I think too, it to me, it just kind of over it overshadows a little bit of the really good job he's done there. Like, yeah. I mean, he had a really good season last year. He's had another solid yeah. season this year. And to me, it just kind of it just overshadows that a little bit. And I and I am totally unbiased on Missouri. Like I'm totally neutral on Missouri. Completely. I don't I don't really care that much one way or the other. I just evaluate them as I as I see right. them. I mean I don't I don't have any sort of bias at all, but that that kind of stuff definitely like turns you off. It doesn't want to make you pull for them. Yeah hundred percent and to me it over it overshadows a little bit like the really good job that he's done there. You know, because I mean he he is gotten Missouri back to relevance and a 10 win season last year, 10 wins are still on the board this year. If he wins uh, against Arkansas and, and a bowl game, like that's really two great back to back years at Missouri. And, you know, it's just like, man, this guy's kind of a punk, you know, I mean, it's yeah. just, I don't know, just some of that stuff. Like you said, it's heat of the battle. I totally get it. But when you're yelling at the other team's players, and stuff like that to me is just way. And it's out. not, and, and, and it's not like it was a heat of the moment thing in the sense of he just said it once and walked away. He was literally hollering it at them over and over again until they recognized that he was hollering at them and then said it again. I just, that is that that is not grown man. That's not what a grown man does. That is childish, childish activity. I just, I, I, I it baffled me that I saw it happening again. Yeah. I, and you're up 29 or 19, whatever you're up, 19. Like, piss off, man. I, you're at Mississippi State, the worst team in the conference. Like, dude is a joke. I am I, I am not a fan of him at all. I am unbiased on Missouri, but I don't – it would bring joy to me if they lost every game they played when he's at the helm, man. I just – what a turd. Great job coaching, good coach. And, I mean, there's no denying that. He's a damn good recruiter, too. He's been doing good in the recruiting space the last few years. But he is a complete joke. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. It was uh, it was definitely uncalled for, and this something that turned you off. And I can't I can't imagine there's probably a lot of Missouri folks that didn't didn't like that image as well. Even if you know they like him, he he wins games and stuff. But yeah, that's definitely something that you know definitely turns you off and not them make you want to pull for him and kind of overshadows a little bit. Um, you know some of the success he's had there. Um, did kind of want to get your thoughts a little bit on, you know, it was kind of a so-so game. I feel like most of what Texas game's been this year, I mean, they handled Kentucky. I mean, Kentucky did a good job of battling for a while. Um, but all in all, Texas just a little bit too much. Um, I, I know Quinn Ewers did go and get an MRI, I believe is his ankle, if I'm, if I'm right on that. So we'll see what his status is for this A&M game, but um, after this chaotic Saturday, Georgia has clinched a spot in the SEC championship game. Yeah, we want to now. apologize to Georgia because we pretty much just wrote Alabama and Penn in there. With, like everybody, I mean, everybody did, and we were along those lines. We just wrote them in pens. Yeah, set it in stone. Georgia's going to be at home watching on the couch. So apologies to Kirby and his boys because uh, they, they locked themselves in this weekend. They don't have to worry about it. They got no more conference games. So, yeah, they are in, and they are awaiting the winner of uh, Texas, Texas a and yeah, no, nah, it's going to be a heck of a scene, I'm sure, in, in College Station this week. But um, you got any thoughts on Texas, Kentucky, kind of how that went? I feel like I said about what 
a lot of Texas games have been this year. Yeah, I mean, just grind them to death. You know, do your little – just stick to your identity and run it to perfection. That's exactly what Texas has done. I felt like I said the same thing about them a few weeks ago, that I don't think that they're – I think they're being as vanilla as they can be right now because they know that they're just better than these teams they're matching up with. I don't think they wanted to show too much before the A&M game. I think we're going to see a, a, lot, a lot different off. I say different. I just think we're going to see a lot more wrinkles added and a little more different concepts than we've seen this year from them. Uh, they haven't really had to use it, not hating on them. They just haven't had a tough, tough schedule. So they haven't really had to open up a playbook too, too much. I think we're going to see a lot of different things this weekend going against Texas A&M. It's a, you know, be huge for Texas. Uh, you know, they already think that they're the premier of everything. So it would be huge for them to, in their first year in the best conference in the nation, to go in and play for the title game. I mean, that's to make it there in, in this day and age and how college football is now and how the conferences are set up. To be able to make it is just a, you know, that's a reward in and of itself. So they know the the, the stakes that are on the line here. And, and, and they understand that if they win this game, they regardless of what happens in Atlanta, they're going to be in the college football playoff more than likely, unless they just get, you know, dominated in Atlanta. But I, I think that they understand the importance of this game. We're going to see a little more wrinkles and different concepts from their offense. And and I think that, you know, that's just why they're – I mean, honestly, when you watch them, I think that they're pretty vanilla the last few weeks because they don't have to be anything special. Am I, am I off base there, you feel? No, I, I, feel, I feel that a lot. I mean, I think they really haven't had to do anything spectacular because – um, just kind of run their, I don't know, base offense is right, but I, I feel like I haven't really had to dig into the bag too much. Um, defensively, they've been really solid. Um, so yeah, just kind of handle business what they what they've been doing. I do think these results in the SEC, you you got, um, you know, Alabama, Ole Miss now with three losses. I think Texas is good regardless at this point because their resume is pretty weak. Like their best wins, Vandy. Um, cause yeah, but have, if they but if they lose to Texas A and M, they would be out. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, they're going to be in regardless. You're right. You're right. Because honestly, at this point, I just don't think there's enough teams there to. You're right. Like like Texas is going to be ranked. They're not exactly. going to let a three team, the three loss team in if they don't have to. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I just don't think, I don't think there's going to be enough quality teams there with a resume to, like, I, I think if Texas, let's say they beat A and M, if Georgia blew their doors off, I still think they're in. I don't think it even. Not only be their second like, loss, and it'll be in the championship it, game. Yes, yeah, so I just, I don't think, and I, I don't think they'll get their doors blown off necessarily. But say say the same thing happens again. They lose by 14 or whatever. I, I don't I don't think it's going to matter because I don't know if there's enough quality teams there to even fill those spots. Like, I mean, really, honestly, at this point, I, what, what's amazing is, and I don't think Alabama's getting in the playoff, but Alabama's probably only going to be like the first team out. When the rankings come out tomorrow night, like they're probably only going to be 13th or 14th. I mean, they're going to be within one or two spots. So there's no way if Texas only has two. I, I will say, all the way I out. will say, if that happens, if that happens, Georgia fans are going to be pissed because they dropped nine spots when they lost to a ranked top 10 Ole Miss. And if Bama only drops six spots or seven spots for this, Georgia fans are going to be pissed. Now, does that mean it's right or wrong? Whatever. I just know that is that is going to make Georgia fans PO'd if they only drop six spots after losing to Oklahoma after Georgia dropped. I think it was eight or nine after they lost to Ole Miss. Yeah, because I'm going to be honest with you. The the reason I say they're probably not – they're only going to drop about 13. Because everybody else lost. This. I mean, you're you're right. Yeah, Ole Miss. So Bama was at seven. Ole Miss was at nine, lost. Uh, BYU at fourteen, lost. A and M fifteen, lost. Colorado at sixteen, lost. So just say Miami, Georgia, Tennessee, Boise, SMU, they'll all jump Alabama, but nobody else is probably going to jump them. Like I guess Clemson could technically, and then South Carolina, but those two got to play. So Alabama's probably going to be like 13th or 14th. That's what I'm saying. Like, I think regardless think? of 
that if South Carolina beats Clemson, they're in? I, it depends on what else happens. I think I think they're gonna be close. I, I think I think they'll I think they'll be close. I, I think it just depends on what the what the rest of the results are, honestly. Cause because you got some automatic bids like right. is a team is a team like Arizona State at twenty one, if they win the Big Twelve, that's an automatic bid. So um it's really tough to say because, like I said, this last week's going to be crazy. That's why I'm really intrigued to see what the rankings are tomorrow night. But that's why I think Texas at this point, I was a little concerned about them if they lost to A&M and then they didn't make the SEC championship. They're a two-loss team with really no good wins. But I think with as much chaos that happened last week, I think Texas is is good regardless because I don't think there's enough quality teams to take those spots. So um, I, I would feel very good if I was a, a Texas fan at this point. It's kind of a crazy year to to go to twelve teams because you kind of look around the country and you're like, do we even have twelve? That's even good enough, you know? Like, yeah. I mean, it's it's fun in one, uh, you know, one scenario because it's that's been a crazy I, year. But. That's why you can go back two years. On this podcast and, and pull it out of the file, I have said from the talk of expanding it from four to 12 that it does not need to be 12 teams. It needs to be eight. Eight would be perfect because you're right. Even in this crazy-ass, most parody-filled college football season that we've seen since 2007, there's still question marks if nine through 12 is realistically have a chance to win the championship. And they're talking about potentially extending it to 16. It needs to be eight. Eight would be perfect. 12, whatever. Don't, you don't need to go past 12, but you're right. I mean, in in the most parity field college football ever, we don't know if there's realistically 12 teams that could win it all. I, to be honest with you, I, if just me looking from the outside perspective, I like – where Georgia's sitting going into this playoff, I think. I think there's a good chance they win the SEC championship. I just you, – you're getting a Georgia team that's had – that's played a really tough schedule, couple losses here and there, had some struggles, but it's like they are st- they still got life. They're going to be better than 80% of the teams at least in this playoff. Like, they're, but, they're definitely going to be one of the two or three best teams in. Now that they're uh, in – if they lose to Texas, are they out? Because then they'd have three losses. And that's what the big debates come down to this whole time is, well, will the conference championship participant that loses, will they get rewarded for that and still make the playoffs? Or will they get penalized for be- losing an extra game while everybody else that's in the playoffs got to sit at home? I, I think Georgia's going to be in. I think, I think so, too. I do. I, I think that that's the only way a three loss team gets in is if they lose their SEC cha- or they lose their conference championship or win their conference championship. Yeah, I, I think so too. I, th- I think they're going to end up being in, honestly, because um, it, it's they need to go 10 and 2 in the regular season. Um, Both losses to ranked teams on the road. Yeah. And I mean, they're played the toughest, one of the toughest schedules in the country. So I just, I like where they're sitting because. They've been there. They've done that. They they've had their struggles a little bit, but nobody was able to knock them out completely. And they're going to go up against the Miamis of the world, the Penn States, the Indianas, Notre Dame, freaking Boise. Dude, they're if they're not honestly, if they're not in the semifinals, I'll be shocked. Honestly. I, th- that's just an outside perspective, no bias, just the way I see it. Some of the mock, the projections for the 12-team playoffs, I- I'll be surprised if Georgia's not in the, the semifinals at least. I, I think it, if it if the projections hold of what it is right now, I think it's probably between Oregon, Ohio State, and Georgia, and Texas. Like, I think it'd be one of those. I'm going to be honest. I'm not high on Oregon. I'm not. But, I mean, I know it was week one, played a close game with Boise, and then got scared by a Wisconsin team that didn't deserve to be on the field with you. I know they're playing up because it's, it's the number one team, blah, blah, blah. I don't 
I don't think that they can do it. I really don't. I don't think that they got the 60 minutes in them to win a championship if they face a team like a Georgia or a Texas or, a, you know, a team like that. Yeah, I just don't think – I just don't think there's going to be any other ones that I, I – like, I agree. Like, they might, they probably wouldn't be my pick, but I, I do feel – I feel good about them making, like, the semifinals just yeah. because I don't know if there's going to be enough other, like – that's fair. I'm not. I'm not gonna pick SMU to beat them. Probably I'm not gonna pick Indiana to beat them. I'm not gonna pick. You know. So it's like it depends on what the bracket is. But That's I don't fair. know, man. I just I like Jordan. They've been there. They've done that. I just I would be surprised if they don't make a run at it. Honestly, and they've I had agree. their struggles. Like they didn't play necessarily great on Saturday against UMass, but at the same time, like. I, I trust them more than a lot of the other teams. That greatest coach in co- the greatest active coach in college football. So, I mean, hard to bet against them. And, and two, like, they're more talented than probably a lot of the teams they're going to see in this playoff. Uh, so. Oregon and Ohio State will be the only ones that could even compete with their roster when it comes down to talent-wise. Yeah. So, I, I, I kind of like where Georgia's sitting. I think, they're, I think they're poised to potentially make a run. We'll see what happens in Atlanta, who they end up facing. Um, but I did want to get into a couple of the previews uh, for Rivalry Week. Um, give me your thoughts on this South Carolina Clemson game, like a game that's not under the radar, but people are talking Iron Bowl. They're talking Texas, Texas A and M coming back. What's your thoughts on South Carolina and Clemson uh, in Death Valley? I don't know why in the world Clemson's a favorite. It's my initial thought. Hammer South Carolina. Um, I think they're going to win outright. Uh, I, I, South Carolina is a team nobody wants to play right now. They are hitting their stride. Uh, dominated Texas A&M. Dominated. I uh, can't remember who they played the next week. Do, uh, Missouri up until the you know towards the end of the game, and then they found a way to win and drive down the field in fifty four seconds or whatever it was. They're a team that is just they can't they can do no wrong right now. Uh, Clemson struggled with some lesser teams this year. They've had to pull some late victories out. Um, I just – obviously, it's a rivalry game. It's a lot like the Iron Bowl. You know, anything can happen. Both teams are going to be up and juiced up and ready to go. There's not going to be anybody, you know, checking out of this game mentally or anything. They're going to be locked in for four quarters. But I just think that South Carolina is the better team. That defensive front is going to give club fits all night, um, day. I'm not sure what time they kick. But I, I just don't see them stopping Rocket Sanders and, and Lenore Sellers with the way they've been running the ball right now. Obviously, Lenore Sellers has been throwing the ball extremely well, too, through for 350-something yards last week or two weeks ago, whenever it was. But I just – I don't see Clemson slowing down this run game at all because the last six weeks, five, six weeks, nobody has been able to slow it down. You got to – if you're going to compete with South Carolina the last five, six weeks, you just got to score with them. You're not going to keep them from scoring. They're going to get theirs. You got to score with them. And I don't think that Clemson is going to be able to score with them at the same rate that, that South Carolina is going to be able to put up points. Yeah, I like uh, I like South Carolina this game. I think – first off, I want to say I love when this game is really high-level and competitive. Yes. Because this is a really great rivalry that I feel like because South Carolina has been down at times over the last decade or so, um, doesn't really get the – maybe the notoriety it deserves because of so many other great games on that day. But, like, we've had a couple really great games between these two, and I love when they're both ranked. They're both high-quality teams. I think it's always a really good product out there. Um, You know, Spencer Rattler, they went into Clemson two years ago and beat them. Um, Just been some really high-level games. So, I love when South Carolina's good and this becomes a really intriguing game. So, I'm excited that we're going to get that. Um, I'm with you. I, I think I think South Carolina's D line can cause some problems a, as they've done all year. Like I said, defense travels. Um, I think they can can affect the quarterback some. Um, and I I do like the way that this offense is playing with Lenore Sellers coming into his own. Um, I mean, with it being at Clemson in Death Valley, I I think it's going to be a close game. Um. Maybe similar to the Missouri game a little bit. Like I think Clemson's going obviously going to put up a really good fight with it being at home. Uh, but at the end, I think with the edge rusher South Carolina has the way, um, the way they've got the run game going on offense and now hit some 
plays in the passing game. Um, I, I think in a, in a fairly close game, I, I like South Carolina, though, and I love when this game is, is competitive and played at a high level because it's a really, really good rivalry. I'm going to be honest. I don't think it's going to be competitive. I think South Carolina dog walks them. I'm being 100% Okay, honest. there we go. I, I like it. Hey, dog I like it. I'm pulling for them. I hope they do I, it. I, I, we know how I feel about Shane Beamer. I think they dog walk them. Um, I tell you a team who better be careful Friday night. Georgia better be careful against Georgia Tech. This is not your daddy's Georgia Tech. This, this Georgia Tech team has upset two ranked teams this year. Granted, one of them turned out to be the worst team in college football in week one, but they were number 10 when they beat them. And then they upset the number four team in college football right now. The active number four team in college football, they upset them too. So just two weeks ago. So uh, Georgia better be careful against this Georgia Tech team because they are uh, known this year for upsetting ranked teams and for playing – really good competitive games with teams they shouldn't play with and then playing down to their competition. So they are known for playing up to the, the competition, the level of competition that they're facing. So Georgia better not sleepwalk through this one. They better come with their A game or they will leave uh, nine and three. No, you're, I think you're Georgia will win. I do think they'll win, but they better watch out. This is definitely a trap game. You're already locked in your conference. This has no bearing on that, but it 100% can ruin your season. No, no doubt about it. I think um, if they lose this and win the SC championship game, now they might not get the at large or whatever. Yeah, um, which We're they would get the automatic. Yeah, yeah. That I mean, they get the automatic, so that would be that's um, right. The SEC and Big Ten, they do get the automatic, but that's, but, that's true. Uh, but if they lose this game and lose the SC championship game, they're hundred percent out. Yeah, so I, I'm with you. I mean, I, I think Georgia wins this game, but it's definitely one you got to be careful of. Like this is a Georgia Tech team that's. You know, they're seven and four on the season. They've had some some tough losses, but they've had some really big wins and uh, you know, most notably against Miami. Um, so they uh they won this past weekend on a Thursday, so got an extra day before this game. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's one Georgia's definitely gotta be careful of. Cause I mean, they gave up some points, some yards against UMass, and so they haven't necessarily you know, we've seen Georgia a little bit inconsistent this year, especially what you kind of come to expect from them. So, this definitely one you got to be careful. You never know in rivalry games. Uh, I kind of like Georgia Tech and with the points. Yeah, I think 19, 19 and, half, and a half is a little rich probably. Yeah. Um, I think they're going to be really competitive. But, yeah, I, I do – at home, I, I like Georgia to win a, a fairly competitive game. But, yeah, definitely got to bring out a good effort Friday night. Uh, at home. And then another team that uh, better watch it is Tennessee because the biggest winner from this past weekend was Tennessee because they were sitting on the outside looking in and they needed, they just needed one piece of chaos to happen. And they got all three pieces of chaos to happen. Every team that, that of the three teams that needed just one to lose, all three lost. So they were the biggest benefiters this past weekend. But they 100% can spoil their own season again if they lose this Saturday to Vanderbilt. It's at Vanderbilt, known as Knoxville West. I uh, I think that, that Tennessee is just – they're going to dominate the the, play, the the blueprints out on on stifling um, um, Pavia. This defense is 100 times better than LSU's, and we saw how LSU was able to, to, to keep them in check. Um, I, I think this offense is going to do some numbers in Nashville. So I, I don't think that they really are going to lose this game. But this, this is another game. This has some big implications because if Tennessee loses this game, they're going to be some sad, sad fans because they 100% control their destiny. They win this game, you lock them into the CFP. They lose this game, they go home with tears. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think Tennessee comes in and handles business, honestly. I think Vandy's been a really good story this year. I think they've kind of ran out of gas, honestly. Like I, I don't I don't know if there's Tennessee ten and a half, hammer it. No disrespect to Vandy, but I, I think the Magic's ran out of the tank, honestly. I, I like Tennessee coming off a UTEP game. So not not a bye week, but you know, mini bye, I guess you could say, coming into this game. So I I think they're fully prepared. They'll have they'll have a large crowd behind them as well. Um, so yeah, I, I like Tennessee to to go ahead handle their business and uh get ready and kind of lock themselves into the college football playoff. But I think 
Tennessee, like I said, golden opportunity to go in there, finish it ten and two, and, and punch their ticket uh, into that first round. Um, and, then, and probably well, host a home game. Do what? And probably host a home game. So, yeah, hundred uh, percent. So uh, yeah, they're they're sitting in good position. You look at Oklahoma LSU. LSU's a six point favorite. Hammer the Sooners. LSU has proven over and over and over and over again that they can't stop a really, really good rushing quarterback. Diego Pavia, yes, he is a dual-threat guy, scrambler type, but he is not a Jalen Milrow runner or or a Jackson Arnold runner when you when you're looking or a Marcel Reed runner. He's not that type of guy. He can run, but he's not the same, he doesn't have the same twitch and the same speed that those guys got. I, I think they're going to utilize Jackson Arnold again the same way they did. I mean, he had over 100 yards rushing against Alabama. I think, obviously, it's not going to be the exact same game plan, but I think that they're going to utilize his run game. I think that's what you have to do to beat this LSU team. I mean, yeah. they they have proven over and over again that they cannot stop it. Of their four losses this year, all of them have had come from rushing quarterbacks. So, I just – or quarterbacks that are able to run well. I just think that – Oklahoma, especially, I know it's after a big win, but you, this is not a game that's hard to get up for, you know, whatever. I think that Oklahoma is going to come in here and, and win this game in Baton Rouge and, and send LSU fans home pissed off. Yeah, this is a game I'm really looking forward to seeing, even though it doesn't have, you know, postseason implications on the line. I mean, both teams are going to a bowl game, you know, out of the SEC race, obviously. So, doesn't really have any – you know, postseason implications necessarily, but I am excited to see this matchup, and I want to see how Oklahoma comes out after such a big win. You know, it's easy to have a little letdown, but like you said, going into Baton Rouge, kind of easy to refocus a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I definitely um, like Oklahoma in the points. I was a little surprised, a little higher than I expected. I figured LSU might be favored slightly. I didn't think it'd be nearly a touchdown, though. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think if Oklahoma plays with the physicality and the the way they were able to run the football the other night, especially with Jackson Arnold, that's killed LSU all year. Um, if they play with that kind of physicality, like if they can out-physical Alabama, Alabama out physical LSU pretty easily. Yeah. So you would think – I know matchups are different from team to team, but – if Oklahoma is as physical as they are the other night, they will win this game. Yeah, I agree 100%. And then the last one before we jump in uh, to the Iron Bowl, Arkansas and Missouri. Arkansas travels to Missouri. Arkansas has really kind of, you know, sputtered it out the last three, four weeks. Missouri's not, you know, they're not world beaters, but they, they played well the last few games. You know, won this past weekend, played extremely well against South Carolina. So, I, I, I think Missouri's going to win this game. Being at home definitely helps them, and, and Arkansas is – they're kind of kind of grasping for straws right now to end the season. I, 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 they're, they're bowl eligible, but, they, you know, nothing to write home about. I just think that Missouri's going to handle business and, and win this game. Let me see what the line is on this game. Missouri's a three-and-a-half point favorite. Yeah, I, I like Missouri, too, being at home. Um, probably, a, probably a little extra motivated, mate, you know, to, to get to nine and three. Like, double-digit wins are still on the table which would be two years in a row. So, yeah, I, I think uh, I think it's going to be a really close game, though, but I think being in, in Cuomo, I think I think Missouri kind of finds a way to get it done. Um, like I said, Arkansas, you know, Taylor Green plays well. You know, I mean, that's kind of the key to the drill for them offensively. But, yeah, I, I would lean Missouri slightly here being at home in the, in the final game of the season. And then looking at it right now, Alabama is an 11-and-a-half point favorite in Bryant-Denny, 230 kick. Auburn has not won in Bryant-Denny since 2010, and that took a comeback uh, as it's coined. Uh, and a, a miracle second half is what it took to, to win that game. So it's history does not bode well for Auburn going into Bryant-Denny uh, this weekend. Like I said, Auburn struggled with their own crowd noise and staying, you know, not jumping off sides or having false starts, whatever you want to call it. Uh, at multiple times in, in big moments on Saturday. So I don't think that bodes well for them as uh, either. Um, Alabama's, uh, they're, they're, they're really, really physical up front. I, I, Auburn's going to have to establish the run game. Um, I think you can be successful running it up the middle against Alabama, but like me and Cam were talking earlier today, most of the success that teams are having against Alabama in the run game is the perimeter run game, getting it outside. 
but I, you can be successful in the in the up the middle game. It's just not as often as the success it's had, you know, on the perimeter against Alabama. So I, I think that Auburn's got to establish the run game one hundred percent to be able to work off of that. Um, if if they if they're put in situations where they're down early, where they they have to abandon the run game, and they're like like Alabama this past weekend against Oklahoma, when they're put in that situation, if Auburn's put in a situation like that early, it could get out of hand quick. Um, Auburn's got to be able to control the clock. I think they got to take a you know page out of Vandy and um, Oklahoma's playbook. You're gonna have to have to rely on the run, and you got to eat clock and come away with points. You got to eat the clock down and come away with points. Some type of points. Obviously, you're not going to score every drive, but you've got to get points. Uh, Defensive-wise, like I said, the last few weeks, Auburn's done a really, really good job with running quarterbacks this year. Like you mentioned, when Jalen Milrow is able to run the ball well, they're successful. When he's not able to run the ball well, they struggle. Um, I I think Auburn is 100% going to be able to not just completely stop them, but I think that they're going to be able to contain Milrow uh, just as well as they've contained the other court, rushing quarterbacks they played this year. I think playing Marcel Reed this past weekend is a great um, practice for going against Jalen Milrow. They are both like to run the ball. They're both really elusive, really slippery, really quick guys. So I think that that bodes well for Auburn defensive-wise is being able to stop the, uh, the, the quarterback run game. But they're going to have to obviously stop the the, the – running backs as well, but the, they cannot get beat deep because the Bama's got some guys that are able to, to take the top off defenses at times and they're left wide open. So Auburn has got to be sound in the secondary. They've got to play disciplined football. So, I, I, you know, know your assignment, complete your assignment, you know, get your man, do your job. That's what it's got to be. You cannot get beat over the top because if that happens, Bama's got a chance to uh, make some big plays. I think if Auburn's able to stop, or, or contain Milrow, I, I think that it bodes well for success for them. But, again, offensive-wise is where I worry about Auburn. Defensive-wise, they've played out of their minds all year. They had some missed tackles and some sloppy tackling. Again, got hurt on third downs. Auburn's third down conversion is not the worst in the SEC, which is surprising to me because it seems like every time that there's a third long, it's going to get converted. There was some second 14s and third and 14s, third and 12s, third and 8s, third and 9s that were all converted against Auburn by Texas A&M this past Saturday. If the Alabama's able to do that in Bryant-Denny Stadium, it's going to end in points. So, got to get off the field on third downs, and that's what Auburn struggled with a lot this year. So, I, I really – I don't know where – I know Auburn's a, a motivated team right now. Bama was kind of deflated after this past weekend because, the, you know, the, the season that they wanted is, is pretty much over. But – it's the Iron Bowl, man. You don't have it. Everybody is ready to play this game. Everybody's locked and loaded for this game. So you never know what's going to happen. But I'm not super, super confident in, in the Auburn Tigers just because of the mistakes that were had this past weekend. If they're not in Jordan Hare Stadium this past weekend, they don't win that game. And you don't yeah. fix that many mistakes like that in a drop of a hat. It, it, they're going to rear their ugly head again. Yeah, man. This game. It's so um, hard to predict, I think. Um, I mean, j- just as a whole, the Iron Bowl in general. But I think going into this weekend, I just – I don't have a great feel of what's going to happen. I could see Alabama winning by two touchdowns. I could see them losing by two touchdowns. I don't think that'll happen, but I could see them losing, certainly. Um, I could see them winning – fairly comfortably. I, I there, There's so much variance. I, I don't know what to expect. My kind of simple analysis is good Jalen Milrow, good Alabama. Bad Jalen Milrow, bad Alabama. It's pretty, <laughs> much, it's pretty much as simple as that. They go as number four goes. I mean, that is – that's about as simple as terms as I right. can put it in. I do think Auburn – will have success. I do think they can have success on the ground, especially if Kane Womack's not putting enough guys in the box like he didn't do the other night. Um, Jarquez is probably the best running back they've seen all year, one of the best running backs in the country. Um, so he's he's going to be an absolute handful. you got to get in there. Deontay Lawson, not much season left, but he's out for the season with his leg injury. So – your green dot signal caller on defense, that's a really tough blow. Um, so, 
you know, that's obviously gonna gonna be an advantage for Auburn there. I mean, he's so important to Alabama defense. So I do think they can have some success running the ball. Um, I, I think the key is keeping them in third and longs as, as much as you possibly can. Um, but I, I do think Auburn will be able to sustain some drives in this game. I just think it's going to be how does Alabama kind of respond to that? Can they get some explosive plays? Because they're very reliant on explosive plays. Um, is the quarterback run game, is that there a little bit more this week? And Because that's critical to the offense as well. So I do agree with you. I mean, being in Bryant, Denny, I'd be scared to death that this was in Jardinair Stadium. So I'm glad it's not. But um, – I think with it being in Bryant Denny, I'm I'm gonna lean Alabama. Um, but I don't I don't feel particularly confident in it because I don't you would totally expect them to come out ready to play. And I ultimately I think they will, but it's just like I I do feel Auburn's probably a little more motivated, to be honest with you. Like the vibes are a little better right now. Um but I would you would fully expect both teams to come out ready to play in this game. Um, so with it, with it being in Bryant Denny, I'm gonna lean Alabama. I, I'll be honest with you, if it was in Auburn, I'd probably lean Auburn. Honestly, um, yeah, I'm I, I think the line, I think the line's ultimately about right. I think it's about ten. I, I think that's fair. Probably um, wouldn't be shocked at all if they covered it. But uh, that's kind of how my honestly my it's this isn't big hard hitting football analysis. I'm sorry to not give that to y'all. But if Jalen Milrow's good, I think Alabama wins. If Jalen Milrow's bad, I think they lose. I think it's about it's about as cut and dry as that to me. Um, you know, I, I think Auburn, like I said, is going to be able to sustain some drives. Don't think they're going to light up scoreboard necessarily, but I think they can do a little bit of what Oklahoma and Vandy's doing. I just think Alabama's got to respond with some drives of their own and uh, not sput around half the day. Absolutely. And before we get out of here, I've got to touch on something from this past weekend. You probably know what it is. If you follow me on Snapchat or friends me on Snapchat, you've seen it or whatever. The rush in the field, man, it has become just a let's go viral tonight type thing. It's a it's not a spur of the moment. Oh, my God, this happened. This is the greatest thing ever. OK, Auburn beats Alabama in 2013 with one of the craziest plays in college football history to go from their literal worst season in school history to beating the defending national champions to go to the conference championship. By all means, rush the field. App State beats Michigan in, what, 2000, 2001, whenever it is. I know it was at Michigan. If App State was at home that day, by all means, rush the field. But Auburn, being a four-win football team, getting their fifth win versus a two-loss 15th-ranked Texas A&M and rushing the field is embarrassing. I'll get to that in a minute of why it's embarrassing. Oklahoma rushing the field versus a two-loss number seven-ranked Alabama team. Embarrassing for your second conference win in Fifth, sixth win of the year. Embarrassing. You want to know why it's embarrassing? It's more embarrassing to me just wipe my snot with his damn snot rag in front of everybody. You don't want to know why it's embarrassing? Because Auburn and Oklahoma are premier programs. Auburn and Oklahoma are expected to win big games at home at night. That is the expectation. I don't like using the word the standard because that that is 100% associated with Alabama and that's, that's coined there. So I don't like using that, but 100% the standard at Auburn and at Oklahoma is you win your big games at home, especially at night. But if you're playing in your home stadium, you are expected to win that game. You don't rush the field when you win a game you're expected to win. I get that Auburn was a dog in this game. I get that Oklahoma was a dog in this game, and they weren't, quote, unquote, supposed to win these games. But the, your programs are historic, good programs. And you just made yourself look like Appalachian State or JMU just upset one of the best teams in the country. It is embarrassing. 
The expectation should be we're going in here and we're going to kick some ass tonight because we're at home, it's a night game, and it's conference, and we're better than them. That's the expectation when you're a premier program. I know Auburn's been in the gutter recently. I know that this year wasn't a great year for Oklahoma. But you are making your program and your school and the logo that you cheer for, you are making that so much lesser than what it actually is when you rush the field after the showings that Oklahoma and Auburn had this weekend. It is completely and utterly embarrassing. It's embarrassing that Arizona State did it after beating a number 14-ranked one-loss BYU that lost to a three-loss team last weekend. It is embarrassing that they did that, but they're Arizona State. They're not expected to compete and have only two losses in a year. They're usually five and six, six and five right now. What six and four, four and six, whatever. They're usually they suck. Historically, they suck. So it's a little less embarrassing for them, but still uber embarrassing. My biggest problem with it is that it's not genuine and it doesn't happen just spur of the moment. These are planned out things. We used to get th three a year if we were lucky. If we were lucky, we're get, we got three on Saturday, and there may have been more that I didn't see. You got Arizona State rushing the field. You had Oklahoma rushing the field. You had Auburn rushing the field. In the same day, within 10 hours of each other, it is absolutely ridiculous that it's gotten this far out of hand. It used to be something fun that you could talk about on Sunday and Monday, the day after, and you know, you'd know talk about it. it was a great story. Now it's just becoming annoying and attention-seeking, and you're doing it to go viral and because it looks cool and because everybody else is doing it. You're not doing it because the genuine love and passion just brings that out of you. It is it, it is getting very, very annoying, and they, they got to do something to stop it because it's going to get somebody hurt with the – consistency that it's happening right now, somebody's eventually going to get hurt and it's going to be bad. But I just think that it takes away from the specialty of the moment when it's done multiple times every single weekend. Am I wrong? Well, I mean, we've probably seen eight field rushes this year. It's, it is not cool anymore and it's not fun. It is 100% annoying and embarrassing when it's done in the moments that it was done this past weekend, 1,000%. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think you're. Uh, I don't think you're wrong there. Uh, I will say this as an Alabama fan: I, I'm not ultra concerned until people stop doing that to us. Like Fair. all three, I, they somebody posted a picture of our last ten road losses, and everyone stormed the field. See, so, and, uh, and, 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 and y'all, y'all lost more than ten games in ten years. So that's ten storm field, ten field stormings in less than a decade. That's too much right there. And that just happened against one team. It is too much. It's ridiculous. Yeah, so until when teams stop doing that to Alabama, I'll I'll be even more concerned. Can, but, can uh, you name a team other than Texas who has rushed the field against Texas A&M? I'll wait. Auburn, that's the only other one. <laughs> Embarrassing. Uh, and and yeah, the teams I mean, that rush the field against you, like Vanderbilt, by all means, rush the field. It's your biggest win in program history. Rush it. Rush the damn field. But Oklahoma, you're a treasured championship program, and you're going to – that is embarrassing. It shows you where you really, truly think your program is right now, and if that's where you truly think your program is, and that's what you think your program means, and that's what it stands for – you're embarrassing as a fan, and you need to look, take a hard look at yourself in the mirror and realize that the program you pull for is not dog water like you're acting like it is. Because everybody who sees that happening, they say, ha a, a, a little nobody just upset somebody big. Meanwhile, the two little nobodies that I'm talking about, Auburn and Oklahoma, are two of the biggest storied programs in college football as a whole and definitely in the conference that they're in. It's ridiculous, dude. I, it, I'm on my soapbox about it because it pisses me off. It is absolutely – Dumb as hell. Well, I I will say this. I, if it helps some with uh, Auburn recruiting, because I think their recruiting section was the first ones on the field. They, they were, and 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 great. I'm glad that it's helping with recruiting, and but that that's what it's. That's why it's becoming more common because it's like, whoa, whoa. I when I was at the recruiting trip at Auburn, we rushed the field, and now I'm at Texas A&M. Are we going to rush the field this week if we beat Texas or vice versa? Wherever they're playing, I'm not exactly sure off the top of my head, but like. It just becomes a oh well they did it there so I got to do it here so I get this recruit it just it it makes it not special and just becomes monotonous and annoying and it's no longer cool it is just a uh I don't know the word I'm looking for but it is I, I hate it I hate it.
Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, it, it has become really common now. I mean, I don't really have many thoughts on it. Three I mean, in a day is ridiculous, dude. Yeah, because did Florida rush the field when they beat Ole Miss? No. You know why? Because Florida's a storied program, and even though they're having a dog water year, they know that their their program that they're rooting for is a much better team or a much better program than to be rushing the field after you beat a two-loss team that you're expected to win because you're at home. Embarrassing. Well, good thing, too. You know, job, Florida. I am proud of you. You – uh. With Auburn rushing the field, you know, they, they get to pay Texas A&M 100 k like like they needed it, you know. Yeah, I know. And it's like, yeah, A&M's really running low in the offers. Oklahoma's got to pay Bama 200 k Yeah, do you, re- do you realize we've made 400 k off losses? Dude, we can we can buy out Nick Sheridan with that money easily. <laughs> you know? I mean, we, we, yeah, we, we ain't got to even worry about Nick Sheridan. We'll, we'll buy his deal out easily, so. That's funny. Um, I just I, I, that's my soapbox for the for the episode though, for sure. So, I get on yeah. one just about every episode, but that's my one for this week. Yeah, we, we got four hundred K in the NIL pot extra this year for all those field stormings when we lost when we lost. I mean, that is I mean, I guess if you lose getting a hundred K makes you feel a little bit better. I mean you hate <laughs> to lose, obviously, but I mean I, I'd I'd rather get a hundred K if I lost and said nothing. So I will take it. But uh no, um did want to get your thoughts real quick before we wrap up on A and M Texas. Who who you got in that one, and, and who you think uh, obviously winners going to the SEC championship? I, I got Texas A and M. To be honest, uh, I think they're still a really good ball club. They're going to be pissed off after what happened this past weekend. They know they still control their own destiny. They're going to be pumped up, ready to go. They they're more battle tested than Texas is this year. I'll say that. Um, and that's why I think it's going to benefit them in the long run. They've had much, much tougher games, a much tougher schedule than Texas did. Uh, and I think that's going to benefit them in, in come come Saturday. Yeah, I'll be honest, I really went back and forth on this. I, I honestly think Texas is the better team. I just think with it being in College Station, with that environment, I mean, it is going to be abs- – I mean, A&M always has one of the First best First time they played in a, a 13 years, 11 years, something like that? Yeah. I mean, let's be honest. You heard Mike Elko this past week. We're looking we're looking ahead to Texas. Oh, I mean Auburn. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yep. Guess what? You went on the road, you lost exactly like I said you would do because I took <laughs> Auburn in this game. You were looking ahead to Texas, I'm sure. I mean, how could they not be? Uh, that that environment's gonna be rocking. That's one of the when that place is hundred thousand strong, it's one of the loudest environments. Well, man, baby. And uh, in, in the in the country. I, I went back and forth this. I honestly think I I think if they played a series, like I think Texas would win. Like I, I honestly think Texas is the better team, to be honest with you. But I, I do think with it and in college station. You, we've all seen how tough it is to win on the road in the SEC this year. It has not happened very often. Right. Um, a good, you know, with good teams, um, e- even good teams going on the road. So, yeah, I'll be honest. I'm kind of like you. I, I think I'm leaning Texas A and M. Like I said, I think Texas is better, and I really wanted to pick Texas, but the home field environments have made such a big difference, and. I know I'm going to get a better version of A&M than what we saw Saturday. Coming back home, like, it's not going to be the same version of A&M. Um, that's just the way this season's gone. So, I, I think I'm with you. I think I'm going to roll A&M, uh, even though I do think Texas is better. And I think I think we get Georgia and A&M in the SEC championship game and uh, see what happens from there. A te- uh, A&M, possibly a three-loss team as – could get a first round bye, which would be crazy. But uh yeah, we'll see what happens. Uh be sure to to like and subscribe to the channel. Feel free to to comment on our videos and anything y'all would like to talk about or hear us talk about. We're we'll love to hear your feedback and um hope you guys enjoy rivalry week. Uh we'll catch y'all back here next week. We're down.